Greetings, UX people of Boston. Welcome. Uh, let's make some noise if uh, you're happy about the CHI and IEEE and G GBC ACM folks sponsoring this, right? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's talk about business. And to do that, I want to start with a usability test. It was an interesting test. We were all in a, a lab in a little town that's halfway between Austin, Texas and uh, uh, San Antonio uh, that uh, testing a company that has an e-commerce site. And we were all staring at this screen. Now, I should explain how we got to this screen. We had a woman who came into the lab who wanted to buy this. It's a coin purse, or it's a, it's a wallet is what it is. It's a, it's a wallet that, that has this incredible pig on it. And she was completely ready to buy this thing. There was only one issue. The issue was that she needed to know if, in fact, it had a zipper. She had another wallet like this, and she would put her coins in it, and it didn't have a zipper. And her coins would end up at the bottom of her bag. And this drove her nuts. So now she wanted a wallet with a zipper. And so we were staring at the product description page trying to figure out if this had a wallet, had a zipper. And we couldn't figure it out. Now, the page was filled with information. It had the price and the size and the description and it explained that it was constructed from a durable leather and a silk blend and it was perfect to store all your daily essentials. But would it keep them inside? That was the question. And we couldn't tell from the product page. So she went to plan B. This apparently is her, th her plan B for lots of the purchases she makes. Plan B was to buy it. And if it didn't have a zipper, to send it back. But to do that, she needed to know what the refund policy was. And so then we started on our second task, figure out what the refund policy is. Turns out this was no easier to find than the zipper. <laughs> we scanned the page for anything that said refund or returns. Nothing came up. And finally, she did what people do. She went to the search box. And she types into the search box, refund policy. And as soon as she types in the search box, refund policy, it comes back and says, no results found. Now, later on in the debriefing, we have all the developers sitting around, and, and we're talking about this no results found on refund policy. And one of the developers comes right out and just says, she shouldn't have found it. What do you mean she shouldn't have found it? She shouldn't have found it because search is only for the site's content, and the refund policy is not content. <laughs> Excuse me? Excuse <laughs> me? The refund policy is not content. What is content? Well, over on the Vanguard website, a financial institution, to them, content is articles about investing. It's videos about investing. If you talk to them about content, if you say to them, what is content, they will come back and they will say, it's articles and it's videos. But it turns out, if you watch users, it turns out it's more than just articles and videos. It's invoices and return labels and transaction histories and boarding passes and refund policies. <laughs> That's content. So this question, what is content? This is actually a big deal. 
if we can understand what content is, we can design for great content. So how do we answer the question, what is content? Well, I've come up with a definition. You can tell me if you like it. My definition is content is what your user needs or wants right now. Whatever it is, whether it's an article or a policy or a boarding pass, it's what the user wants right now. Take a site like Yelp, trying to figure out if we want to go to this restaurant. Well, one way we figure it out is through the ratings. But another way might be, how close is it? And we may not be able to deal with street addresses because it's a city we're not familiar with, so instead we want to see it pictorially on a map. Or uh, uh, maybe we're interested in finding the website to see what the menu might be or whether they take reservations. Any of those things at that moment could be content. To suggest that one is more content-like than the other is a huge mistake. And of course, we know not only want to do this on desktop, we want to do this on whatever device we're walking around with. So content has to be universally available on everything. And we can't just decide what content goes on which device. We have to make sure it's all there because we can't predict what the user is going to want. Now, what does it take to do this? Well, we learned from the search exercise in Drumfells, Texas, that uh, uh, information architecture is a key part of content. And we learned from Yelp that interaction design is a key part of content. And we need both of these things in order to create truly delightful content. It doesn't stop there. This is a boarding pass, one of my favorite documents in life. <laughs> this particular boarding pass became the project of a dude named Tyler Thompson. He looked at this thing and he wondered why he had it. And he even came up with a little story that explained how it got to be what it is. And he wrote it up and he put it up on the interwebs. And the story went like this. Hello there. Thank you for flying Delta. I am sure you are no doubt trying to figure out what the fuck to do with this piece of paper you have in your hand right now. You're confused, lost, and just want to get on your flight. It's cool. We don't really care. And we're sure as hell not going to make the process any easier or enjoyable for you. Instead, we hired a small blind parakeet to lay out your boarding pass, you know, just to keep you guessing. Have fun. <laughs> Turns out Tyler Thompson's a graphic designer. And he did not like the graphic design of this uh, uh, pass, so he decided to redesign it. And this has actually become a, a sort of internet meme. He, there's a whole group of people who have redesigned his boarding pass. And each one of them looks better and better and better. But you can look at this pass, and it is substantially easier to work with than the pass that Delta gives out of the machine. Now, of course, it's actually more expensive to produce. They'd have to go and change all their thermal printers and all the other devices that are involved. And he didn't take any of that into consideration. But the spirit is there. Having something that's easier to read, that communicates the information better, is better design. It's better content. And it doesn't just happen on a boarding pass. This is an old screenshot of the, of the uh, TripIt mobile app. And if you're a frequent flyer, one of the things you frequently need is your flight number. You need to find the flight. If there are multiple flights to a city, you need to be able to figure out which one is the one that's late on the board. So you need the flight number frequently. And it's there, but it's in little type. In fact, it's in smaller type than the flight number you don't need at that moment which is the one you're connecting to. <laughs> the other thing you need if you have a delayed flight is this little magic six-letter code called the locator. The locator is how travel agents figure out that you're not getting to where you're going. And 
the locator is key to any travel experience if you have any amount of trouble. Where's the locator on this page? Well, it's hidden way down below the fold where, where you can't find it. Now compare the visual design of this version of TripIt to a competitor, Kayak's mobile app. If we look at Kayak's mobile app, which has the exact same information, we can see that the flight number is much more present, much more obvious. And the locator code is right there, right where you would need it if you were in a rush trying to deal with a delay. I guess dealing with a delay in a rush seems like an oxymoron. But unfortunately, <laughs> dealing with a delay in a rush is, is, is often an occasion that you get in the airport. This is the thing, right? The deal here is that the only difference between these two apps is the visual design of the display. All the other information is exactly the same, because all they're doing is reading the, the, the flight information out of a database. So it's fascinating that by just changing that one variable, we have success. So what that means is, is that visual design is also a key component to creating delightful uh, content. So now we can start to look at this and see all the things that are involved. And it turns out that these aren't the only three things, that there's an entire spectrum of things that go into creating great, delightful content. And this spectrum of things are actually the same spectrum of things for all user experience design. All of these skills are required. Zappos, very popular e-commerce website. And one of the things that makes it an e a popular e-commerce website is its return policy. Plastered all over the site, easy to find, is their return policy. Because they started by selling shoes, now they sell all sorts of stuff. And it's common practice for people to order many things and send most of them back. And they actually encourage this behavior by giving free returns. And people love it. Now to make this work, they have worked really hard on the instructions for sending stuff back. And they go so far as to get, make it really easy for you to print out your own shipping label so that all you have to do is drop it off at a UPS fulfillment center uh, or a, a shipping center, and they will ship it to you. And to get this, they had to employ all these skills. And it turns out that these skills are critical for designers, so much so that there's a project that I'm working on right now with uh, Dr. Leslie Jensen Inman we are creating something called the Unicorn Institute. And what we are basically doing is figuring out how to create the next generation of industry-ready designers in all those skills. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, a little later. But it turns out this is absolutely key. And driving this at the center is content. Last year, at this very time it turns out, was a critical moment in the history of the NHL. They were in the midst of the lockout. The lockout, if you remember correctly, was this complete disagreement between rich people and rich people <laughs> about who was going to be more rich. And in that argument, which lasted 113 days, they took a lot of very poor people who work in the concession and entertainment and, and, and supporting industries of uh, uh, the NHL and made them a lot less rich while they argued over who was going to get more rich. And one of those groups of people were reporters. Sports reporters were really hurt hard because at this particular time, basketball was pretty dull. 
Hockey was even duller. Football had just ended. It, it was a miserable time for sports reporters. They didn't know what to do. And after about 20 days, you can't keep saying the same thing about the lockout over and over again. So for 113 days, reporters had nothing to write, except for two really clever reporters in Montreal. These two guys at the Montreal Gazette <laughs> decided that every night what they were going to do was get out their version of EA Hockey 14 or 13 and play the games that were scheduled for that night <laughs> and then write the story about those games. <laughs> and it turns out this got them not only you know something to do, but it became quite popular. So popular that both American and, and Canadian press picked up that they were doing this. They, they did an interview for Bloomberg Business Week where they talked about how, how this worked. And they're, 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 they said things in Bloomberg like, well, when the Canadians lose, it's a lot easier to get quotes out of guys when you make them up rather than having to hunt down the guy who's hiding. <laughs> But most importantly, during this period, they created the highest readership of the newspaper in the entire period the newspaper's been online. They peaked out the numbers. People would, would go straight to read the results of a fictional hockey game every day. <laughs> it was amazing. Around the same time, there was another website that came out. It's called The Gist. And The Gist was basically um, The Onion meets real news, sort of like a daily show for print. And they would come out with stories, like right after the uh, marathon bombing, they came out with a story uh, uh, that said, FBI asked media to frighten people with facts only. Uh, when uh, Anthony Weiner announced his, his election for mayor, he said, amateur genital photographer considering return to politics. <laughs> <laughs> and my personal favorite, when American Airlines had a glitch in their operation software and had to ground almost all their flights for a day and a half, they published a story that was called, computer glitch halts American Airlines flights until they can be delayed for regular reasons. <laughs> And as you can imagine, the glitches traffic was incredible. And they did a fabulous, fabulous job of, of getting people to come visit the site. And it's just fake stories. It's just crazy. Fake stuff doesn't get you very far all the time. This is a map of a town in Ireland called Airfield. And one of the notable things about Airfield Ireland is it does not have an airfield. <laughs> but when iOS 6 maps came out, the maps application decided to put an airfield icon next to the word airfield. And this not only was inaccurate, but according to the Irish government, was a safety hazard because they imagined that some pilot in their Cessna would have an emergency and, of course, reach for their iPad and look up a map and try and make an emergency landing in airfield where there's no airfield. <laughs> and, of course, iOS map had, had lots of problems, such as a, a postmodern apocalyptic view of Central Park <laughs> and uh, a flattening of the Eiffel Tower and another tragedy with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and the depression of the Hoover Dam and putting a Burger King in a church in Copenhagen. And unlike the gist and the Montreal Gazette, this was not so much taken as amusement by many people who were dealing with it. What makes all these three things in common, the gist, 
the Montreal Gazette hockey reporting and Apple Maps is that content was at the center of this. Content was right in the middle. And you can't escape content. It's really part, the, the core reason people are coming to your design, no matter what that design does. But we can take it a step further. And we can start to sort of analyze successes and failures. We can say that the content at the Montreal Gazette was definitely a win. We can say that the gist was completely a win. And we can say that iOS 6 Maps content was completely a failure. So let's think about that for a second. Why, well, first, why did Apple Maps fail? It wasn't for lack of trying. They actually tried very hard. It turns out that creating map software is really complex. There's a lot going on. You have to have a sophisticated operation to take in all that data and do something smart with it. And Apple Maps, the reason they went that direction was because when they had first released the iPhone, Google basically gave them access to the maps almost for nothing. In some ways, Google never expected much to come of this. But come iOS 6, six years after the release, Google realized that they'd given away a lot of value. So they wanted to make it up. And Apple was asking for some new functionality. And Google said, sure, but you're going to have to pay market rates for that. Apple didn't want to pay market rates for that, so they decided to come out with their own maps. And they went through a lot of work to do that. They went out and they acquired three established, well-respected mapping companies. Got all their data, all their technology. They then took all the data they could get from 10 major sources and they combined it. Well, that was all well and good. But what Apple didn't realize was that was not quite enough. What Apple didn't know, what nobody knew, because Google had never told anybody, was actually how much effort it took to create Google Maps. Turns out that Google had compiled 1,300 data sources, two orders of magnitude higher than what Apple had done. And Google Maps, which had been around for more than a decade, they, originally, they, they realized how quickly their data was faulty. And so they assembled a team to correct the data problems. That team was a thousand people who had worked for 10 years, mostly in Asia, correcting errors in the maps, like the airfield in airfield. And that 10,000 person year effort had start is what Apple was missing. That and, you know, 1,290 data sources. And that was what caused the problem. Apple just did not have the same resources that Google had to do this work. How much were those resources worth? Well, in the months after Apple came out with iOS 6, they saw a substantial decline in their stock price. Market cap went down $279 billion. Or, as the gist put it, Apple unveils smaller version of stock price. $279 billion turns out to be quite a bit of money. And sure, not everything about that devaluation had to do with iOS 6 maps, but it wasn't helping. And that's key. And here's the crazy thing. Apple did not see it coming. They were completely blindsided by this problem. They ended up firing key managers over this. And 
they were hurt bad. But here's the deal. Nobody in the publishing industry saw the Montreal Gazette success coming either. Gazette certainly didn't see it. The dudes playing electronic arts hockey certainly didn't see it. And nobody could see that happening. I talk to people all the time and what they tell me is they're not, they don't want to do plain old user experience work anymore. What they really want to do is strategy. They want to help companies with their strategy. Strategy is an interesting word. We use it all the time. What's our strategy here? Here, Apple had a strategy. It failed. The Gazette, they didn't have a strategy, yet they succeeded. So, so what is this strategy thing? Strategy is what we employ to achieve a particular desired outcome. And the problem we have is that the things we call strategy in our work, things like content strategy and user experience strategy, right now we can't use those strategies to predict outcomes. We have no knowledge on how to do that. Content strategy, user experience strategy, is in essence broken. Because it's not real strategy. We're missing that key piece. And what's at the heart of that key piece is understanding business models. Last year when you were here, I talked about what it means to, to go buy a tablet. Let's say you want to buy a Samsung tablet at a Best Buy. How does that actually work? So you go in, you, you give them money. The way that money divides out is that when you hand it over, Best Buy keeps half of it. They give 40% of it to Samsung. And the remaining 10% goes to a distributor whose job it is to get the tablet from the factory at Samsung to the store at Best Buy. And this is not unusual. This is how pretty much every retailer works. There's you know, this network of manufacturers, distributors, and retailers, and they divide the money basically this way, no matter what is being sold. Well, if we compare this to Apple, it turns out that in many ways it's similar. Apple has a retailer, a distributor, a manufacturer. Just happens to all be Apple. Which means they get to keep all of that money. They get 100%. Actually, that's not quite accurate. The reason it's not accurate is if you're comparing Apple to Best Buy, the difference is, is that Apple never discounts, but Best Buy does. So in fact, if 100% if of the deal is what you're talking about at a Best Buy, then at Apple, it's more than 100%. This is designed. This is intentional. This is not an accident. Nobody makes more than 100% by accident. This is intentional. That's what design is about. Let's look at a different business model. Let's say. We go to Amazon to buy an iPod. Now, here's the deal with iPod. They're really expensive. This one here costs 149 bucks, right? If you buy it at, at, at the Apple site. If we buy it at Target, costs, uh, they discount it to 145. Over at Best Buy, they, they undercut them at 144.99. <laughs> but at Amazon, you can get it for 139.99. How does that work? Well, it turns out that Amazon is uh, 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 capable of actually making no money on this product. They can sell it at cost. Turns out they can sell everything at cost and still make a profit. At first, that doesn't sound possible, but it turns out that it is with a little magic thing that they employ called the cash float model. And the way the cash float model works 
is that it's based on three little facts. The first one has to do with, with inventory turns. Right? Amazon turns its inventory every 20 days. Now, for those of you not familiar with the term inventory turns, that basically means that Amazon goes out and buys product from its vendors and distributors, and it sells everything that it buys within a 20-day window, and then it buys more. That's, a, that's the financial term, inventory term. Now, to understand whether 20 days is good or bad, you have to compare it to something. So let's compare it to Best Buy. Best Buy, on average, turns its inventory every 74 days. Now, th that's not remarkable, but what really makes this important is the fact that both Amazon and Best Buy follow standard industry practice, which means they pay their vendors every 45 days. So how does this map out? Well, we want to plant this out, the way we look at it is simple. Best Buy buys its product on day zero. And on day 44, they have to pay the vendor. So they send the check off to their vendor. Meanwhile, they're still working through their inventory. It takes them 74 days to sell everything they have. So the last customer orders that last product on the 74th day. And the way credit cards work, they don't actually receive the money until the 76th day. So that time between the 74th or the 44th day and the 76th day, Best Buy is basically running on debt. Because they've spent the money, but they haven't collected it from the customer yet. And this is the way pretty much every business works except for Amazon. Now, Amazon does have some similarities. For example, they too buy their products on day zero. Turns out it's the best day to do that. <laughs> and they pay their vendor on day 44, because that's the deal. But they have sold completely out of the product by day 20 and collected the money on day 22, which means they have 22 days of float. They have your money for 22 days before they give it to the vendor. And they, could take, they take that money and they invest it. They get, you know, some returns. Not great, because these days nobody gets great returns. But they get returns. If they had to, they could sell everything at cost and still make money. No other vendor could do that, so any other vendor would go out of business before Amazon would because of the inventory terms. This is not an accident. This is intentional. This is designed. And that's the key thing about things like cash flow models. Business models are designed. You want to have a great business, you have to have a great business model. You have to have great business model designers. Now, one question I have that is, what about uh, nonprofits, right? Nonprofits aren't in business. They, this stuff can't possibly apply, right? Well, the fact is, is that business models are important to nonprofits. Not because the nonprofit has to have a profit, but because it has to be sustainable. The difference so people confuse nonprofits with unprofitable companies. <laughs> They're not the same thing. The difference between a nonprofit and a for profit is a for profit distributes its profits to the shareholders. But a nonprofit has to keep it and reinvest it in the business. And it does that for growth. So if you look at any successful nonprofit, what you see is a business model that actually allows it to remain sustainable. So let's look at something like a health clinic. A health clinic has all sorts of services. 
whether those services involve uh, outreach or collecting fees or raising donations or uh, uh, reducing costs. They do those things in order to remain sustainable. So the design elements of a business model are just as important at a nonprofit as they are at a for-profit. Not only that, all the elements of the business have to support it. Take a university. University has a website. What's the university website supposed to do? Well, Russell Monroe over at XKCD created this Venn diagram to explain the difference between what appears on a university homepage and what people go looking for on a university <laughs> homepage. And it turns out the only thing those two communities have in common is what the full name of the school is. <laughs> That's bad design. And that bad design hurts the business. Because if people can't get the information they need, they can't interact with the institution the way they want. It becomes problematic. So we can see this. We can see that poor content hurts the business. So we can think about this on a scale of frustration to delight. And the thing about uh, um, uh, this is, is we go out, we do our user experience work, we measure the, what's going on, and if we look at the content, if it's not working, it's going to frustrate the user incredibly. And so we can sit there and we can eliminate that frustration, make the content better and better and better, and we work our way up the scale till we get to what we would call usable content. And that sort of gap between frustrating content and usable content really is about making sure the content just doesn't suck. That's, that's what we're doing there. But as you notice, we're not delighted yet. We're just at that sort of neutral point. If we want to work our way up to delightful content, we have to then become delightful. We, and we have to figure out what that means. Now again, we can take this idea of content and we can substitute in a different idea, right? We take out content, we put in experience. It's the same thing. You, we cannot separate content from experience. They are uh, inevitably tied together. And really what's happening here is that there's a basic equation, which is that not sucky is not the same as delightful. And for years and years and years, in the world of, of usability, user research, we have focused in the area of not sucky. <laughs> but we actually don't know much about this world of delight. We don't understand how to, how to deal with that. And part of it is because the interaction is completely different from a design standpoint. In order to make something not sucky, we have to remove frustration. But if we want to make something delightful, we have to add delight. So it's a completely inverted model. We have to understand how to add things where we were used to removing things. And this is why it has been such a struggle for us to get beyond this sort of notion of sort of neutral usability. We get stuck there. And only just now are we having conversations about how to push past this. But here's the deal. That delightful stuff, it does not come for free. It has to be paid for by a good supporting business model. So what are our business model options? Well, if you want to get a lesson in business model, one of the best places to get a lesson in business model is from South Park. In particular, an episode where a character named Tweak discovers that 
little gnomes are coming in the middle of the night and stealing his underwear. And so Cartman and Tweak and other characters decide to chase down these underwear gnomes and they find the underwear gnome lair, which is stacked tall with underwear. And they have a conversation with the gnomes, who turn out to refer to themselves as business experts. <laughs> and they have a business plan. And they reveal their business plan. It's on a sign. They pull away the curtain. And the business plan has three phases. Phase one is collect underpants, and phase three is profit. But in the middle, there's a question mark. They say, well, what's phase two? Well, we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> This is Silicon Valley. <laughs> you ever wondered how Twitter makes money? We know how phase one works. It's collect underpants. It turns out that if you go to a business school, they'll give you a slightly different model on this. They will tell you that in essence there are five priorities that a business has to have from a strategic standpoint. You have to be able to increase revenue, or you can decrease costs, or you can go out and get new customers, increase your market share as it were, or you can go out and get more money from your existing customers, increasing your business share is what they call that, or you can give a increase the long-term value of your business to get more investments, and that's shareholder value. It turns out these are the only five things that business people worry about. You focus on these five things, you will succeed. And it turns out that we can map this into content. We, we, for instance, we can take that return uh, instructions that Zappos put together, and we can explain it in the terms of those five priorities. Because having clear instructions means that fewer people call the call center, which decreased costs. So that turns out to be a huge payoff, because they can measure the cost of every call. That's easy to do. You take the amount of money you spend on support, you divide it by the number of people you have answering calls, you then divide it again by the number of calls each of those people handle, and you now know how much it costs to handle a call. And so every call you reduce by having clear instructions, you decrease a cost. So we can measure that. We can measure the effectiveness of the content. The better the content, the better the business. How about that shipping label? How does that play out? Well, it too decreases cost because it is clear as to how to use it, and it makes it uh, absolutely clear to the customer. Plus. They're able to negotiate these bulk deals with UPS, and that turns out to be a, a, a huge savings across the board, because in their bulk deals for all the packages they send out where they give free shipping, they get to include all the packages that are coming back, and that just increases volume, and UPS will give them an even bigger discount. So that turns out to be a cost savings for them. But the other thing about the shipping label is that Customers have said, because they provide this label so easily, they buy more product. So they get an increase in their existing business. And they see an increase in the revenue as a result of that. And both of those things have translated into a massive increase in shareholder value, so much so that Amazon bought them primarily because of this. So that turns out to be key. How about that video sitting on the Vanguard site? How do we map that into it? Unfortunately, this is sort of a phase two question mark problem. <laughs> this is underpants gnomes. We don't know how to put that video. We sort of have a hunch that profit is at the end of it, but that step in the middle, we don't understand. So OK, so now we have these five priorities. We can map these things together. We can, we can put these things in place. But again, the question I always get is, well, you know, increasing revenues, decreasing uh, costs, 
These things are, are business ideas. I work for a university. How does this ha help me, you know, as the person who's in charge of the English department website? I'm not thinking about these things. Should be, right? Because getting more enrollment, getting more alumni donations, getting all sorts of uh, uh, services and fees that universities charge, that increases the revenue coming into the university. Decreasing the amount of times people call to figure out if their application has been accepted, all of those details, that decreases costs. Offering new programs and clearly describing them gets new people to attend, raises tuition for those programs. Similarly, getting people to stay on or to take more courses, do other things, that increases revenue from the existing customer base. And endowments are the equivalent of shareholder value. So it turns out that all of these things play a role and we can map the activities we do as designers into how it will affect each of these things. Or government. How does this work with government? Let's say I work on a program like uh, WIC, Women, Infant, and Children, where I'm dispensing or helping dispense the, the, the benefits to, to women who are uh, 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 in need of, of good, healthy products for them and their child while they're young and can't afford them. So same sort of deal. They don't have revenue per se in the WIC program because it's not a paid program. But getting constituents to participate will increase funding. So having more participation turns out to be key. Of course, decreasing service costs is how we factor that in. Getting people who are not taking advantage of this program to start taking advantage of it is like increasing market share. Getting more of the people who are enrolled in the program to take advantage of all the different services they offer, like uh, doctor's visits and vitamin care, is also uh, the equivalent of existing business. And finally, getting Congress to continue to fund these programs is shareholder value. So it turns out that these five factors play out in any business we're talking about, in any organization. It's the same five things. We have to get good at mapping them to the local vocabulary, the local language, but they're there. And we can talk about our design. We can talk about how the website we might design for the WIC program would, in fact, do all of those things. So if you go to dictionary.com, we can play this little game. It's called Find the Content. Where is the content on this page? It's way down there. If I remove everything that's not content, I'm left with a very small piece of real estate. In fact, if I do the inverse, you can't tell anything's changed on the page. The page is not about getting you a definition. It's about getting you to do something other than finding the definition. It's all about getting you off the page. My good friend Adam Connor made a tweet. I was interested in what he tweeted, so I click on the link, expecting to get what he tweeted. But instead, I get this thing about backup services. I'm really confused. Turns out what I needed to do was click on this little link over here that says continue to media. That's what the sort of thing I would say at home. Honey, can we continue to media now? <laughs> <laughs> Who uses words like this? <laughs> well, we're done continuing the nourishment. I'd like to continue to media, please. <laughs> <laughs> that will be our full evening engagement. <laughs> Stupid language. So. Continue to media delivers me to this. For which again, what the hell am I looking at? It turns out he wanted me to look at this, this screenshot. Everything else on the page was not the screenshot. And we can map this into 
uh, uh, our little mapping here, right? Where suddenly what we have uh, uh, is, you know, ads. They're all about increasing revenue. The more page views, the more ads, the more click-throughs, you get revenue. That's what they're about. And since it's the only way that dictionary.com collects money, that's where it is. But here's the deal. When you don't pay for the product, you are the product. They don't make money off of dictionary definitions. They make money off of you. They want you to come and you to click and you to move through the thing. That's how ads work. Except here's the truth. Ads don't work. Here's some little fun facts about banner ads. The number of ads that a typical internet user sees in a year is 1,707. The number of ads, uh, uh, the average click-through rate on those ads is one out of 1,000. So if you look at the best performing uh, banner ads, the four, uh, uh, 68 by 60 banner, they actually get 4 out of 10,000 clicks. The number of ads that are estimated that users never see because they appear below the fold or they don't load in time, but the company still pay for, is 31%. 31 out of 100. And the number of clicks on mobile ads that are probably accidents is 50 out of 100. And my favorite statistic, the chance that you will be kill, uh, survive a plane crash over clicking on a banner ad in your life is 478 times. Right? You are 478 more times as likely to click uh, uh, to, to, to survive a plane crash than to click on a banner ad. It's a good life. <laughs> so ads aren't working for the businesses either. And it's not just the paid ads that we see this happening on. We see this all throughout the user experience. Take a site like Walgreens. Walgreens is your sort of typical e-commerce site. And the home page of Walgreens has a typical traffic pattern. If we look at where people click, what we find is, is that approximately one-fifth of the visitors to the site click on the photo section of the site. It turns out that photos are the most popular thing that people go to Walgreens for. 16% of the users go to search on the home page. 11% go to refill prescription followed by another 6% that go to the pharmacy. So that's 17% that actually use the pharmacy functions on the site. And the fifth most popular thing is one out of every 20 users goes to find a physical store. So if we look at those combined, what we discover is that 59% of the traffic goes to those five links. But now let's take the amount of real estate that those five links occupy, and that's only 3.8% of the page. So there's this real disconnect between what people are going to and what they're being presented. And what they're being presented are, in essence, ads. And guess what? Nobody wants the ads. Nobody wants ads. We know this because if your service turns around and offers for money an ad-free service, people will buy it. How many people here have ever upgraded a phone app to get to the ad-free version by paying money? Yeah, that's incredible, right? There's an industry where people are spending thousands of dollars on ads that you just paid $2.99 to get rid of. Right? $2.99 completely devalues those people's work because nobody wants ads. Well, the advertisers will tell you if you target the ads, they'll work. 
that, that context is important. And to some extent, they're right. But you have to be careful how that context things works, right? We're putting ads everywhere. You can now find ads in bathroom stalls. Right? And this gets a little creepy. Actually, it gets really creepy. <laughs> The targeted advertising that's put in the right context actually has an effect. In fact, one of the first studies we ever did, we, we, we found this out. We were watching people uh, uh, visit informational sites. That was the entire purpose of the study. This was way back in, in 1995 we, we, we found this out. And we were watching people visit informational sites. And what we were doing when we were watching them was we, we they created a set of tasks and we asked them to research those tasks and we found this woman who was uh, in the study, she was 14 weeks pregnant, she went to about.com and she found this page that said your pregnancy week by week and it was the 14th week of the, of the pregnancy and she read the entire page top to bottom. This was what she was interested in and she, we watched her read the whole page and at the very end of the thing she saw this ad for this book, your pregnancy week by week and she says I want to buy this. So okay. You, when you get home, you can buy it. This wasn't an e-commerce study. We, we weren't studying e-commerce. In fact, we'd never done an e-commerce study at this point, so we didn't know anything about it. And, 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 and she said, no, no, I want to buy it now. I'll never find the page again. <laughs> like, okay, I, I guess you can do that. So she, she, she clicks on the link and she starts to fill out the purchasing stuff and she puts in her credit card. We, you know, we're catching this on videotape. We've not prepared for this at all. And, uh, uh, turns out this is how we funded our research from this point on. <laughs> and, and, uh, but she, she bought the book right then and there. And the thing is, is that she wouldn't have bought the book if the ad had been on the home page of the website. She wouldn't have bought the book even if the ad had been at the top of the page on the website. It was only because she'd read all the stuff, loved it, and wanted to get to week 15 and 16 that she wanted the book. And this is called a seducible moment. And a seducible moment is when you bring that in at the right moment. You bring it in and you make it work. And to some extent, this is the difference between advertising and experience, right? Advertising is this sort of broadcast thing where experience is that it fits right into the moment. So we can, we can take uh, stuff and we can, we can put it into play. And we can understand it. But then there's things like this. Ship my pants. Right here? Ship my pants, you're kidding. You can ship your pants right here. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow, I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I just ship my pants and it's very convenient. Very convenient. I just shipped my drawers. I just shipped my nightie. I just shipped my bed. If you can't find what you're looking for in store, we'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you for free. I love this ad. It cracks me up every time I see it. I will never buy from Kmart. <laughs> and that's the thing, right? We can create really enticing, fun content, but it does not work. Because it, it, at the end of the day, I don't buy it. Right? It's, it's a funny piece of content, but it's not going to sell me anything. So we can sort of map this out. And we can look at it. On the one hand, uh, uh, the material, you know, what we're doing is we're disrupting the user. On the other hand, we can just integrate it right into their process. And of course, if we look at another dimension, we can go from broadcasting to targeting. So how does this all play out? Well, random banner ads are heavily broadcast and can often be very disrupting. Okay. Whereas uh, uh, those full screen and stitchels, the things that pop up in front of things that you have to click to get to, to see the content you're there, those are completely disruptive to the user's experience. If I start to 
look at the user's behavior and figure out what they're doing and place ads based on what they've done in the past. I can be a little less broadcast, but I'm still pretty disrupting to the experience. I can do things uh, like the My Pregnancy Week by Week book that's more topic related, uh, integrated into the experience. But again, it's still broadcasting to some extent. The best performing ads don't look like ads. They're basically word of mouth. Think about how you learned about your favorite restaurant, how you learned about your favorite vacation resort. Chances are it was a friend who told you. Right? Word of mouth is the most powerful thing. But it's really hard to control. We come up with things like Yelp-like reviews, which are close to word of mouth. They're not the same because they're not necessarily people we know. But we go in and we look at the reviews, we read them, and if we trust the reviews, we'll go with it. Those are good too. But here's the problem. Companies have marketing budgets. They need to spend. And if they start to spend it on things like Yelp-like reviews, it feels really creepy. So companies are really frustrated because those things that work best are things that are completely out of their spending control. And really what this means is that advertising is an awful business model. We cannot use it effectively. And as designers, it needs to be the business model choice of last resort. So then what do we do? What's our option otherwise? Well, we can move into other things. That's exactly what the New York Times has been doing. New York Times just came out with a redesign a few weeks ago. And the most remarkable thing about the redesign is how few ads have started to show up on the site. The ads have basically gone away. And it's incredible. But how do they pay for the site? Well, it turns out that they had installed a year and a half ago the third complete redesign of something that now has the name metered paywall. And the way the metered paywall works is you get to the bottom of an article and it tells you that you only have a few more left before you have to pay. And then after you've used up your metering, 10 versions a month, it then pops up a message that says, hey, we'd, we'd love you to look at our content, but you're going to have to pay something. Oh, thank you, sir. And that's the metered paywall. And in the year and a half that the metered paywall has been in existence, the New York Times has figured out how to make it pay more revenue than what they were making from advertising. So now they're reducing the number of ad units on the site, which in turn makes each ad unit more valuable to them. They've made their articles longer, so you no longer play this game of having to click to page two and page three and page four, whose entire purpose was to serve more ads. And they've made a better user experience by reducing the amount of advertising on the page People are willing to pay for that. And so now we can take this metered paywall thing and we can look at it with our factors and see that it, in fact, is getting new viewers to the site who are now participating and paying. It's getting more money from their existing subscribers. They get more revenue than they've ever gotten before. And their shareholder value is better now than it's ever been before. Others are trying this. A blogger named Andrew Sullivan decided to create his own website, to go out on his own and basically create his own meter payroll experience. In the first 24 hours, he sold $330,000 worth of subscriptions. And in the first three months, he got that number up to $660,000. Now, granted, the revenue stream has sort of petered off on that. but. It was an interesting experiment, and many, many institutions are now looking at alternative models to advertising like metered paywalls. The thing about metered paywalls, they require excellent content. Or, as the gist reminds us, the New York Times wins four Pulitzers for whatever the hell is going on behind the paywall. <laughs> Right? You have to have a reason to pay the money. Commodity content is not going to play. It turns out that other institutions have figured this out. And suddenly we're seeing all sorts of folks 
go down this road. Public radio, for example, shows like Radio Lab have, who have traditionally raised money through cutting off the show and begging during Pledge Week, instead have gone to a new format where they actually do live performances of their radio program and charge for them and fill and sell out major theaters all over the United States. They just did a round of 30 shows. Every single one of them was a sellout at $35 a ticket. Way more revenue than they ever could raise. And that's one show on WNYC. One show was able to pull that off. Not every show on WNYC is going to be able to pull that off, but the most popular ones can support the less popular ones. And that's how that can work. A friend of mine, Minion Fogarty, has a website called Grammar Girl. If you ever want to learn good grammar, this is an awesome website to learn it from. She's fabulous. And I asked her how much of her revenue comes from advertising. As you see, she has ads on the, on the site. Today it's uh, selling uh, uh, salad dressing by half-naked dressed men. <laughs> like you do. <laughs> uh, uh, but it turns out that that only accounts for a third of her revenue. Two thirds of her revenue come from co collections and products that she sells on the brand of Grammar Girl. And these turn out to be very popular. You can find these books in every bookstore. And we can see that, that as we play with this stuff, there's all sorts of things happening here. You know, a newspaper, classifieds, they work different than, say, an eBay listing. And it's just in the implementation of the two things, right? They get paid when the ad is placed in the newspaper. But eBay gets paid when the item is sold. It's a subtle difference but it changes the dynamic of the design. Similarly, Craigslist, when they are selling uh, ads for some of their sold properties, uh, like their, uh, 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 their rentals, versus Airbnb, Craigslist gets paid when the ad is placed, whereas Airbnb gets paid when the property is rented. Again, subtle distinction. Different in the design, it's different in the business model. And we can see how those differences play out. We can actually see which scenario is better. We can run forecasts and we can understand this. And so business models allow us to play with the experience to get the best returns. But interestingly enough, the business model also can let us play with the returns to figure out how to get the best experience. And so, as designers, we sort of need to understand both dimensions. We have to understand how this works. And we can take it a step further and look at where we can add value through the content itself. There was an experiment done by a bunch of uh, uh, literary folk over at the University of Michigan. It's called the Significant Objects Project. And what they did was they went and they bought cheap little things on eBay, things that were under $5, like this uh, Russian doll. It turns out they paid three bucks for it. And then they got writers, famous writers, professional writers, to create stories about these dolls. In this case, the writer went and talked about how it was their great-grandfather's doll and how it saved their grandmother's life when the house burned down and, and all, you know, how it's been a token and passed down from generation to generation. And there's a whole story around it. And then they took the story and the object and they put it back on eBay and in this case they sold it for $193.50. <laughs> the only difference is the story. The story changed the value. Content change the value. Is it content if it's false? It is content if it's false. Okay. Speaking of false content, let's buy a camera. <laughs> if you go to walmart.com, 
The product descriptions from one page to the next are always different in format and structure because the product descriptions are basically whatever the manufacturer supplies. Walmart's buyers take the product description from the manufacturer, plasters it up with the product. And compare this against uh, uh, a, another retailer uh, like, like uh, Crutchfield. Now, Walmart's content is whatever they supply. It's very technical, very simple. Crutchfield does something different. Crutchfield, which is a minor retailer, uh, uh, their buyers actually write all their content. So they don't take what the manufacturer buys. Instead, they play with the product, they learn from it, they write down all the descriptions, they write full, detailed descriptions and reviews and tell you what's good about it, what's bad about it, and they have all sorts of content. And it's, and it's very deep and it's, and it's filled with, with good information. When we watch people buy cameras, we would give them a budget, we would tell them, we would find out what camera they wanted to buy. These were all people who were in the market to buy cameras. We would actually give them the cash to buy the camera so that we could watch them go through the experience. And what would happen is, is that if they went to the Walmart site, they would do what happened on a lot of e-commerce sites. They would buy something for less than the money we gave them. In this case, they'd only spend 89% of the budgeted money. But Crutchfield was different. When we brought people to Crutchfield, they would not only spend all the money we gave them, but they would add 137% to the budget and spend that. So they would spend way more on Crutchfield. And the big difference, same products, the big difference was the content. The content made the difference. So now we can, we can again plug this into our model and talk about how basically Crutchfield fires on all cylinders. And that's how they do it. So going back to the underpants gnomes, we can see how this works. Right? And it's the same deal. We create delightful content. In the end, we have profit. What the hell happens in the middle? Except now we can talk about it. We can talk about how a metered paywall works. Or how our lead generation system might work. Or how we promote the content's value pays off or how investing in the user's flow pays off, or how we make people want to share the content we produce, or how we reduce calls to support. All of those things are within the capability of design. All of those things affect the bottom line. And suddenly, we now have our strategic priorities. And what we've learned is that the best UX strategists they create the light by working in the intersection of business and design. So here we are, Leslie and I, and we're creating a new type of design school. We're designing a school from scratch. And what we've realized is that to design this school, we need to not only teach the basics of usability and interaction design and information architecture, but we have to teach the basics of business. <coughs> Everybody needs to know how these models work. They need to know how to go into a business and do this. And that's what we're doing at the Unicorn Institute. And uh, if that's something that interests you, by the way, you can find out more information about what we're doing at unicorninstitute.com, a URL I was extremely happy was available. <laughs> it made me very pleased. Uh, and, and we can tell you about that. So, to summarize where we've been today, content is really what the user wants and needs right now. And we can create delightful content, but we have to understand that it's basically the center of the experience. So delightful content means a delightful experience. And if we understand how what we do contributes to the business model, we will be successful at creating great businesses that have great experiences at the center of them. And Please, please, please use advertising as a last resort. <coughs> if you found this the least bit interesting, you can get more information on all the things I've talked about. UIE.com is a website where we have a, a ton of useful stuff. And by the way, uh, uh, you all should have received, if you don't, I have more up here, these cards. Uh, this is a new thing we're, we're, we're just sort of launching. You guys are like the first folks we're giving it to. And 
you guys can have a, a, a two complimentary months of this thing called All You Can Wear. We have basically, for the last, since 2007, we've been recording these virtual seminars. I don't know if you've heard of the virtual seminars. They're 90-minute webinars that we do. We've recorded 120 of them, and we're now making them available to you for free for two months. Uh, 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 so that's 120. So you've got 60 days. That's two a day. So you better get started tomorrow. Um, uh, we did discover a bug. Like I said, it's the first time we're giving it away. And we, we, you have to type ACM in all uppercase. It's case sensitive. So you, that will work much better. You type it in lowercase, you get to see our lovely 404 page, which isn't that interesting. But uh, uh, by all means, try this out. At the end of the two months, if you want to continue watching them, it's just 23 bucks a month. And you don't have to put in your credit card until you get to the end of the two months. So, so uh, 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 only if you want to continue what we ask you for a credit card. Up until that point, you just put in your email address and you go. You start watching tomorrow. Lots of good stuff on all the topics I talked about. Uh, also, I want to invite you to, to uh, connect up with me on LinkedIn. If you work in UX or you work in design and you're, or you're interested in these topics, uh, please, I love talking to people on LinkedIn and, and sign up and leave me a note. And I, I will definitely talk to you there. Uh, finally, you can follow me on the Twitters where I talk about design, design, uh, the business of design, design education, and the lovely customer service experience that the airline industry regularly delivers. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, uh, I talk about all those things. And that's what I came to talk to you about, ladies and gentlemen, your moment of zen. Love some big ass saving. Kmart shop your way members save 30 cents a gallon. 30 cents a gallon? That's a big ass discount. Big ass discount. A really big ass discount. Really big ass discount. Honey, this solves your big ass problem. Totally solves my big ass problem. Yeah, look at that big ass truck. Big ass man. <laughs> <laughs> Shop your way members, get big ass savings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have you done any studies showing how uh, advertising and increasing the amount of advertising decreases use of the site by uh, users? That would be useful to make that very visible to all the people who love think advertising and, and videos and flash and everything to chew up your CPU is just what you want. Uh, there have been a lot of studies that done this. There's a whole field called direct mail, which in fact does exactly those studies. Uh, uh, the, the problem is, is that the advertising industry uh, has built up immunity to, to actual data. <laughs> and so they, they, uh, uh, their gene pool has, which is quite inbred, I might add, um, uh, is, is really <coughs> No amount of actual logic about real user behavior is what they're interested in. So they are quick to dismiss it and throw it away because millions, billions of dollars are based on ads working and those jobs just go away like that the minute they discover they don't. And that's why they are completely panicked about companies like the New York Times, which have proved that more ads diminish the service. And that's why the companies are, going, are, are moving away from that model. Yes? Jerry, one, one um, perhaps this is an exception, but the, one of the largest internet companies and one of the most profitable of all makes practically all their money on advertising. They do. You're referring to Google, I and imagine. Is that because they're targeted ads, is, or is it an exception for some other reason? No, it's because Google is all about targeted advertising. So the thing is, is that they collect a tremendous amount of data. They collect everything you search, they go through your email, they, if you use an Android phone, they pay attention to everything you do on your phone, they now will be able to tell how, what temperature your house is at. Um, <laughs> and not only do they do that for all of us, but they actually do that for, uh, 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 with everybody who works for the NSA. So the question is, who has more information? Um, uh, if only Eric Snowden worked for Google, we'd know a lot more. <laughs> The, um, uh, uh, because they have all that information, they can start to highly target and, and high, highly move. But, you know, AdSense, which is one of their big products, they find that AdSense ads actually quickly become ignored. 
So they constantly have to change the format of the ad access ad, ad to be more disruptive to the experience to take you away from the content that AdSense is next to. And that process is problematic. And so while they are making a lot of money, most of the money they make uh, uh, is, again, uh, it, it's, it's through this sort of belief that they can create metrics that tell. And really, the metric is only the click. But we don't know how many clicks are on purpose and how many clicks are by accident. And how many times have we clicked on something by accident and left the site? Uh, uh, Google doesn't always factor that information into ad quality, and as a result, uh, uh, the people are paying for clicks that they are actually not getting any value from. And we are very close for the people, for the people, the advertisers, the, the folks who pay for the ads, for getting all that data about what's actually happening with their brand, and what they are finding over time is that it works much less than they like to know. And right now, they're just discounting all that data and saying that can't be right. We, obviously, there must be more to the story. You know, it must have to do with recall. It must have to do with other factors. You know, here's, here's the recall thing. So I'm speaking in front of a room full of marketers and advertisers. And they're saying, well, if someone remembers your brand, that's important. And OK. So let's play a game. I'm going to say some words. You tell me what the next words are. And the words I say in this room of, of 500 advertisers is uh, uh, plot, plot, fizz, fizz. What are the next words? Oh, what are the fizz? That's brilliant. The last time that ad was run was in 1972. In <laughs> right? the audience I was talking to, most of the people in the room were not born at the time that ad had been run. How many people here have bought an out to sell product in the last six months? Wow, it's working! <laughs> right? Ad recall does not mean uh, 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 that the ad is working. Talking about big ass savings does not sell gasoline at I don't even know where you buy gasoline at a Kmart. <laughs> so so it's it's crazy, right? So so this process does not work. And, and advertisers refuse to acknowledge that because the problem is that if they, they think if they walk away from the table, they will kill their business. So they keep putting it. There's a, there was a guy in, in Philadelphia named uh, uh, Wanamaker. He ran a, a chain of stores. And he once said that I know half of my advertising budget is a complete waste of money. The problem is I just don't know which half. <laughs> My conjecture on the Wanamaker theorem is that it's closer to 95% that's the complete waste, but they're not willing to give up that 5%. So they just keep throwing the money out. Sir? You took away my Wanamaker question. Okay. But did you know that he went on to become the Postmaster General and created uh, junk mail? <laughs> he reduced, I, I, I did not know that. His economic reasoning was uh, to allow you know the Sears catalog to go out into the, uh, at, uh, at, you know way below cost out into the countryside, and therefore the farmer who was you know two days from the nearest railhead would actually buy something, which would, happened would pull yeah so it was fantastic now if they could just kill it <laughs> well it, it'll kill itself it, it, or the trees will do it or something uh, we have questions. Uh, uh, there are very annoying ads, and then there are ads which are just sort of there and don't bother you too much. And if I see a site that doesn't bother me too much with ads, and I know that that's the reason the site is free, I will occasionally click on some ads to make sure that that um, free co good content for just a, a few bothers, likely bothersome ads, continues, whereas these sites that come I up with I hope you click on products you don't like. <laughs> well, because you're you're hurting the people who actually sell the products for those ads. No, so they're I, spending money on ads that you didn't buy anything on. Well, that might demotivate them to put the ads out there. But the fact is, but then I, your, your 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 site doesn't make its money. Well, uh, Google uh, is a good site, and I would frankly prefer it to stay free. So once in a while, if I have why, why why would you prefer it to stay free? Why why would you not? If, if it could actually make a better site to pay for it. And this it's is, this is the other way. You know, nobody demands free cars. No, it's we all need transportation, but we don't demand free cars. We, we really don't demand a whole lot of free food. Well, except tonight. 
<laughs> the, uh, the cards are a lot more expensive than a click or a web page. Uh, and, and, and so, for example, now that toll takers are being eliminated by these automatic toll collectors, at the end of the article it says, and now we may be able to introduce these, these uh, automatic toll taking machines in more places. Yep. You know what that means. We're going to be paying for it everywhere we go, eventually. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> okay. There we go. Um, Good luck with that. <laughs> my, my um, I guess, observation is that um, even ads are content uh, from a user experience standpoint that's valuable real estate that's turning into distracting content, uh, content nobody wants. Right. And so maybe there's a spectrum of uh, quality of content yeah. and whether or not it falls all the way to something totally valueless to the user all the way to, oh yeah, that makes sense because it's targeted and that might start to go across the spectrum, or you know, the um, dividing line between lesser versus better quality. And then of course there's the content they wanted, which is the most valuable, hopefully. Look, look, if, if I'm a manufacturer of uh, high end quality gear for mountain bikers, the best places I can advertise my stuff is on websites that mountain bikers visit. And the websites that mountain bikers visit are websites about mountain biking, right? And so if I can place ads on the website about mountain biking, there's a good chance that people will click on those ads because it's highly targeted. But you know what's even better than that? Is to have the, the site about mountain biking actually go on about how awesome my product is, right? And the way I can get the site to go on about how awesome the product is is to take all that advertising money and put it into the product, okay? So we're spending all this money trying to drive attention. If we took half of that money that is spent on advertising and we put it into experience design, which would have the bigger return on investment? And that's what I've been trying to say, is that the reality is, is that what we can now do is talk about which of those five things we, we will move, which needles will get moved, because we made the investment not in advertising, but in creating better products and creating better experiences. The number one poster child for this was Netflix in the early days. Blockbuster had an advertising budget of $30 million a year. They would spend it on million dollar Super Bowl ads. Netflix spent nothing on marketing the first five years. They spent it all on creating a great experience. Which company do you do business with today? <laughs> okay. That's the value of a great experience. And the companies that figure that out spend almost nothing on advertising. Apple is one of the largest companies in the world. They are completely outspent by all their competitors by an order of magnitude in advertising. They don't have to. They've created a great experience. Cirque du Soleil produces tremendous experiences in their live performances. They make more money every night than all of Broadway, their ticket sales. Their advertising budget is one-tenth of what Broadway spends. So take the money and put it in the experience and see what it gets you. And this is the thing that businesses are becoming aware of, but they don't know how to execute. And guess what? We know how to execute. We have to be able to talk to them about this. Uh, one back here. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> I'm in way in the back. So yes, I see you. Um, I'm way up here. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I think we would all agree, all agree, those of us who are designers, that ultimately, of course, we want the best experience and all of your um, points about the business strategy are very well taken and totally on point. So for those of us who are in big companies and aren't in positions yet where we have power to influence the business model, um, I work at PayPal and no one's listening to my ideas about the business model, <laughs> why would they? Um, what, what would your advice be for those of us in like design roles to start making these compelling arguments to people who actually have the power to change the business model, short of just saying it's a better user experience, it's a better user experience. So, so here's the way this works, right? We go in and we say, 
they're not listening to us. We need them to, 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 to listen to us because we know how to do this right. And then we turn around and there's someone standing behind us who knows, thinks they know everything about design. And they come with these stupid ass design ideas. And we're like, why are they trying to do this? And you know what they say to their friends? I know about design, and they're not listening to us. Right? It's the same thing. Here's the deal. If you want to be able to talk to these folks, you need to understand what they're trying to do. They have a language. They have a language that includes words like shareholder value, that includes things like revenue reduction, that includes things like cash flow models. Right? You need to learn what those things mean. You need to be able to understand them. You need to ask them, why did you do it this way? Design is the rendering of intent. And those things were designed with intention. Those decisions were made on purpose. If you say, what, are, what is the outcome that you are intended because you made the decision this way instead of that way? You start to ask those questions the same way if that person standing behind you said, hey, what you did there was really interesting, different than what I would do. Can you tell me what was your intention? What were you hoping the user would do differently? What were you hoping we as a business would get from that design, right? If you start asking the same questions and you start learning the language and you start being able to talk about those things, then just, just as it happens when you talk to a stakeholder and they go, so why are we doing it this way? You go, I don't know, it's the way we always did it. We shouldn't do it this way. And they go, I don't know, but why are we doing it this way? And, and suddenly you have this conversation about things that neither of you know anything about and you can have it. Same thing happens in business, right? Why are we charging customers this way? I don't know, it's the way we always did it. Our competitors do it. Do you think there's another way to do it? I don't know. Right? Imagine what those first meetings about the meter paywall was like. Right? And, and the meter paywall was this incredibly sophisticated system. Did you know uh, that if you're not a New York Times subscriber and you've used up your 10 articles, but you, get a, you go into Twitter and someone has tweeted an article and you click on the link, it will still let you see the article. That's a very explicit decision because they want people who are active on Twitter to never get that paywall thing. They only want them to get it when they've clicked on the link within the article that says, oh, by the way, there's this other cool article. Oh, I want to click on that, right? They learn very quickly that it's a turnoff if you click on a link in Twitter, or same thing happened to Google. If you Google a topic and the New York Times bubbles to the top, you will get to see the article. So, so you click on it from Google, they will let you see it. And then the next article, and remember, you've already used up your 10 for the month. So they know you're active on the site. And now you've seen an 11, and now you've clicked on an article, a link that's, you know, you know, most emailed article link about, you know, something cool. Then they go, hey, dude, you got to pay. <laughs> right? That's intentional. That was very thoughtfully designed. And you can get past the paywall because all you do is Google the article and then you can find it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> the, 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 the fact is, is that that's a very thoughtful intentional design. And that asked the question. Someone thought about that. Someone designed that. Someone said, how can we support the business? When do we want to let people through? When do we want to enforce the paywall? And it was brilliant. And that's why they're making more money doing this, because they're catching people at that moment, like, oh, damn, I really have to pay for this. They even put the icing on the cake, because if you say, okay, I'll, go, I'll pay for the paywall, they'll offer you the first four weeks for 99 cents. Yes, they, yeah, they <laughs> would not. Right, so Ed, Ed, Ed reminds me that the first four weeks are 99 cents, and beyond that, then you, you pay, uh, it's, 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 you know, like $1,000 an article. <laughs> it's high quality stuff. Poets are winning things. So it's, it's worth it. It's worth it very much. Over here. Okay, you said. You gotta use the mic. The, the, okay, the you said purpose. no advertisement. But I think there are cases where you need the, some advertisement to point to your company. It's like a bridge or a link, I think. You need an advertisement to point to your company. I, I, again, if I'm making the gear that mountain bikers love, then I can put the link on the mountain biking website a couple of ways. One way is I can buy my way onto it, 
But the other way is I can get every mountain biker to keep talking about my product. The word of mouth thing. Yeah, but what's wrong with just ha have a little advertisement so that there will be a third kind of way of pointing to your company? Nothing because is not wrong every, with it. Not every big company, not every company is uh, Netflix and so forth, okay? Yeah, but Netflix wasn't Netflix when it started, <laughs> right? Netflix was nothing, right? I'm, I'm, you know, instead of going down to the corner and watching a movie, to, getting a movie to watch tonight, I'm going to have them mail it to me. That seemed like crazy, <laughs> right? It, 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 and it completely tanked the local co corner store, which offered every possible convenience except having the movies you really wanted to watch. And so that was that was the thing. And, and, and so, yeah, I'm not saying that people should never advertise. I'm saying that as a business model, it is the least desirable business model to support design and to support good experiences. If you don't care about the experience that your user has, then by all means, go down the advertising route and create a website. But, but any site, you have a choice of a site that doesn't have advertising or a site that does, people will choose the site that doesn't have advertising if it has the same quality stuff. And people will pay money to get better quality stuff and ignore the advertising. And you can make more money as a, as a content designer, you can make more money by providing better quality experiences. And the companies that pay for the advertising, yes, it's going to be harder and harder for them to get to those places. But the fact is, is that if they take their advertising money and they put it into a quality experience, they will get more word of mouth. And we know that word of mouth pays off better than a link on a website that doesn't really tell you anything. No, I totally agree with you that the, the website got to be really good. Okay, I totally agree. Okay. <laughs> So with the New York paywall thing and the the New York Times, so it's obviously better. But is, did you say any numbers on that? So is it actually is New York Times making more money now? Like what? The New York the New York Times dot com is making way more money, and New York Times' revenue is up over the last two years from where it was two years ago. So this, so this is going to take off. It sounds like. They just redesigned the entire website. If you're a New York Times subscriber, you've heard nothing but how awesome this new leader paywall thing is and how awesome their new design is. And they redesigned the website so that it focuses on more metered paywall and less advertising. They are removing ad, ad inventory from the site. No other publisher has ever done this before. They are removing the number of ads they can sell in order to create a better experience. So yes, I, I, my assessment of that is they have bought this hook, line, and sinker. And it was after years of experimentation. And by the way, the New York Times, up until recently, owned the Boston Globe. And the Boston Globe didn't go that route, and they sold the Boston Globe. <laughs> and it's now owned by someone who spends a lot of money on advertising. Last <laughs> <laughs> question. And makes a lot of money on advertising, <clears throat> a la the big Budweiser wall. Sir. Thank you. It would seem that the major transition, the game changer here, is that the customer has changed. The New York Times, probably for the first time in the newspaper business, the reader is the customer, whereas before the, the customer was the advertiser. So what implications do you see on content creation and on what influences what would be covered? In general, as, you know, if advertising is the z-bar of the web age, then you know, what does that imply? Yeah, the, 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 they are going direct to customer now. They are doing what lots of businesses did, and they're eliminating the middleman of the advertiser to pay for things. And we see that in all sorts of places. We are less likely to use a travel agent now. We are uh, uh, less likely to, to uh, use resources to do all sorts of things that we used to do. We don't go to stores as much as we just buy things on Amazon and have it shipped to our house, right? There's all sorts of sort of reduction of the middleman that's happening in a variety of places. And that's what is um, uh, uh, driving, that the, you know, the internet gives us power to do all of these things that we've never had to, we've never been able to do before because we can automate this technology behind it. And so now, the New York Times can actually figure out 
which content is most compelling and what about it is most compelling and use that to drive more subscriptions. And that is really interesting from that model. Now here's the thing. The best writers don't have to publish at the New York Times. David Pogue just left, uh, their top technology dude just left the New York Times and went to Yahoo, right? So one of the struggles the New York Times will have, and has had for a while, is once someone gets awesome and gets a reputation for creating awesome, how do they keep them at the Times? How do they not prevent them from becoming a free agent and going off and selling their awesome to the highest publisher who can who can do better by that writer. That's the same problem the Patriots have. <laughs> it's the same problem the Patriots have. It's the same problem the Red Sox have. So maybe that's why the Boston Globe will get awesome. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing on time? Uh, we, that was the last question. That was the last question. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for encouraging me.